Hi, everybody, and good evening to all of you, and thank you for joining us uh, for this interesting little topic about uh, dentin adhesive agents and bonding that I like to talk about in the context of the invisible bonded interface. Because unlike other areas of restorative dentistry, uh, where we deal with a composite, it can show you a clinical picture of the beautifully shaped anterior or posterior resin. Where we talk about uh, sectional matrix bands or other instruments, the most important component of a composite restorative material is the interface between the resin and the tooth in terms of its longevity, yet it's something that we can't see. We really don't understand what is involved in the creation of, of this bonded interface. I come to you from beautiful Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Creighton University is a Catholic Jesuit university. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as the dean of one of the 66 dental schools in the United States, but still stay fairly active in my research program primarily around dental materials. Omaha, Nebraska is a very unique place just for anybody calling from either of the coasts. Uh, it is the headquarters of the Strategic Nuclear Forces for the United States, located at a military base just south of the city. In addition to the disclosure from Catapult, uh, through our research center, I've been the principal investigator on numerous clinical and laboratory trials for a number of dental corporations. Uh, Dents by Koch, 3M, Premier Dental, GC America, Ivaclar, you can see these companies listed on the screen. My goal today, while to talk about a few very specific products, is to try and provide the fundamental understanding for the mechanism of how modern dental adhesives work and key technique tips for you as a clinician to get them to work better. In addition, I participate, as Lisa mentioned, with the Catapult Group, which is a group of key clinicians and other educators throughout the country. Uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this group. Our focus at Catapult is to help you maximize your practice by maximizing the understanding and education that you have about clinical dentistry. So as we look at the landscape of all of the dental adhesives that are available, we know that there are three major categories of adhesives, the so-called total etch or etch and rinse adhesives, uh, the self-etching adhesives, and the recently introduced, fairly recently introduced, so-called universal adhesives. Now, when we look across all of these, they have some certain commonalities. First, they started off as some kind of an idea. And I think as dentists, we need to be cognizant of being both evidence-based and lifelong learners. And so I'd like to take just a moment to talk about the differences between what is state-of-the-art and what means standard of care. So state-of-the-art represents something that has been reduced to practice. So our universal adhesives, adhesives that we can use with phosphoric acid or use in a self-etching mode or use in a selective etching mode, which we'll talk about in some detail this evening, are they state-of-the-art? Yes, they are. They employ new technology. But once something has been reduced for our use, we need to understand whether the material or technique is efficacious. Efficacious means, efficacy means something that under the most ideal condition works. So do universal adhesives actually bond? And the answer is yes, they are efficacious. But in the context of real clinical dentistry, clinical effectiveness means does something work in real practice. So do universal adhesives work in real practice across a variety of clinical situations? And if they do, can they then become the standard of care? Now sometimes these materials, as, as we go through uh, standard of care materials, can maybe be a standard of care for a while and then become some kind of useful adjunct. So just because it says it bonds, does it bond? And here in this clinical photograph, we see one of the major manifestations. Um, sorry here. We're having a little technical difficulty with my PowerPoint. There we go. One of these manifestations, seeing around the uh, interfacial marginal adaptation of these restorations, we can see the dark shadow, which we know clinically is likely recurrent caries, most likely as a result of leakage at the interface between the composite restorative material and the tooth structure. 
So part of the dilemma that we have with adhesives is something that bonds immediately. How long do these bonds last? What is the substantivity of the materials and the adhesive agents? Now, if we look at this clinical situation and we look, for example, at the area here, this area that I'm outlining around the enamel will likely become the most important component of clinical success for this restoration. Now, we spend most of our time evaluating the color, the shade, the polish, and the shape of these kinds of, of composite restorations. Yet the most important component of their longevity, and this is an obvious example in an anterior situation, is the interface between the restorative composite and the tooth for long-term success. Here we see a, a, a clinical case where we've elected to do laminate veneers. And here is the finished case. And we're bonding porcelain to tooth structure so that we can get the maximum adhesion of the relatively weak porcelain to the tooth structure. And so as a result, um, we, we're, we're dealing here, and we're trying to advance the slide here a little bit, just bear with me. We're dealing here with uh, a very important uh, adhesion principle of binding to enamel. Now, bread and butter dentistry here, replacement of silver amalgam fillings showing that there's a broken filling on the first bicuspid on the buccal side. Replacing these, these restorations with composite resins, again, we focus so much on the beauty, so much on the contour, so much on the polish, but the application of the adhesive agent is just as critical or more critical, this invisible interface for long-term success of these restorations. So one of the standard methods that we in the research community look at is when a new adhesive comes out, we take, as we see on this screen, some class 5 abrasion, abfraction, erosion lesions. We sometimes may roughen that uh, sclerotic dentin up. Most often we isolate the teeth and we then proceed to restoring these, these teeth. And we look at some very fundamental principles with these materials. Um, so what we look at here are retention. How long will these stay? These are not mechanically retained. These are retained in these uh, non-retentive cavities purely by the power of the bonding agent that we're using. And we also look at marginal gap and uh, marginal stain around these. Now, if we look at the traditional adhesive systems, five years of service with these non-retentive cavities Modern adhesive systems, the traditional etch and rinse or total etch adhesive systems, generate 95% retention rate after five years across a number of adhesive agents for these kinds of cavities. So when we talk about newer systems, we have a very high benchmark level. Now the classification system that most of you are probably familiar with is this one. This is a classification where we classify the type of adhesive by generation. So a fourth generation adhesive consists of using phosphoric acid etch, etching and rinsing it off with a bottle that's a primer that's applied and a separate bottle that's a thicker adhesive agent that's applied, a so-called three-step system. The fifth generation systems were two steps where we use phosphoric acid rinse that off and applied one bottle. So the primer and the adhesive were combined into one bottle, prime and bond NT probably being one of the most prevalent materials in this category. Then we move into the so-called self-etching adhesive systems that are consisting of two bottles where we would have a primer, an acidic primer applied to the tooth, not rinsed off, followed by an adhesive. And then we have the so-called all-in-one single-step systems Initially, product like Xeno-3, where two materials were mixed and then one liquid applied to the tooth. And now there's a number of products such as Xeno-4 uh, and products of that ilk that are one bottle self-etching systems. But I'd like to categorize these in a different way because generations imply would be less technologically advanced less state-of-the-art, less standard of care, and seventh and eighth generation systems imply better. That may not actually be the case, and that's 
very dependent on specific products. So it's better to think about do we etch and rinse and then how many bottles or components of an adhesive system do we apply to the tooth. So three-step etch and rinse systems are the so-called fourth generation materials. Two-step etch and rinse systems, so-called single bottle systems, would be fifth generation. Two-step self-etching system where no rinsing of the materials are done would be the so-called sixth and then we have the one-step self-etching uh, self systems. Now the newest systems on the market are combining single bottle systems that can be used with phosphoric acid conditioning and rinsing or used in a self-etching mode that we're calling so-called universal adhesives. Now are these eighth or ninth generation? It really doesn't matter because their utility of how we use them as clinicians is the most important part. The decisions that we have to make with these universal adhesives is do we use phosphoric acid and that is based on the clinical situation, the amount of enamel, the amount of dentin, the depth of dentin, and the ease of isolation. But regardless of what generation or classification of adhesive that you prefer to use, all of these adhesives fundamentally employ the same mechanism. Essentially, we're removing mineral appetite, calcium phosphate, and we're replacing that with resin monomers. In the case of the so-called total etch or etch and rinse system, we remove the mineral appetite with phosphoric acid and rinse that off. And then in a separate step, apply the monomers. With a self-etching system, this process, removal of the mineral and infiltration of monomers, is done simultaneously. But all of these systems are replacing what has been removed. Now this is important because we know fundamentally when we do a cavity preparation that we want to fully fill the cavity with our restorative material, with our composite material, without voids because we know the material uh, must be placed in that way for longevity. Well, the same thing is true microscopically of dentin adhesives in particular. If we demineralize the tooth, we make holes in the tooth, we must adequately fill those holes with resin monomers to create the seal and the interface between the restorative material. Now, this is difficult to do because we're dealing with two very different materials when we're talking about bonding to tooth structure. Enamel is very highly mineralized with a minimal amount of water. Dentin, on the other hand, has a lot more uh, water in it. It has mineral appetite, but it also has proteinaceous matter and collagen in it. So enamel, mildly hydrophilic, has some water. Dentin has a lot of water in it, and we're taking a hydrophobic material, composite restorative materials, or in some clinical situations, cement and attempting to get them to link themselves to the tooth. Now when we look at bonding to enamel, it's an interesting uh, fact that the uh, use of phosphoric acid to adhere resin materials to enamel was pioneered in 1955. And today it is still providing for us the most reliable and durable bond to enamel of any adhesive technique available. And so this is simply putting an acidic material, in the, in the case of dentistry, phosphoric acid in the tooth, demineralizing that surface, creating microporosities, following of which we infiltrate resin monomers into the microporosities, polymerize them, and through micromechanical retention, get the resin to stick to the enamel. Now dentin is much more complicated and is a much more complicated structure. At the end of a cavity preparation, we leave on the surface of dentin a debris surface, tiny bits of material, which we call a smear layer, and a small of that smear layer, which we term a smear plug, into the dentinal tubules. Now the blue on the slide represents moisture in a vital tooth that is present in a, in a vital tooth. Also in this smear layer from the cavity prep, if you're using carbide burrs and sterilizing them, we have discovered bits of steel in the smear layer. This will become important in just a moment. Now on the left-hand side, if we modify the smear layer, 
no conditioning, or slightly modify it, this would be the way the smear layer is treated with self-etching adhesives. These are the, the, the adhesives that have acidic monomers in them that modify and slightly dissolve the smear layer while they're penetrating the tooth. On the right-hand side, what we're terming conditioning is actually acid etching. And in this particular case, we remove the smear layer completely when we rinse the phosphoric acid off the tooth, and we expose collagen represented by the little orange strings. We then will infiltrate the resin monomers from the adhesive in and around the collagen to completely surround it and penetrate the underlying dentin. This happens on the left-hand side of the screen with uh, self-etching adhesives simultaneous to the slight solubilization or dissolution of the smear layer. So mildly etching or mildly modifying the smear layer consists of self-etching uh, adhesive philosophies and techniques using acidic monomers in a no-rinse adhesive. Etch and rinse or total etch where we use phosphoric acid again removes that smear layer completely, solubilizes a little bit of the underlying dentin and exposes collagen. Now this is one of the very important techniques for an etch and rinse total etch adhesive on dentin is after removal of the acid is to leave a minimal amount of moisture in the collagen to prevent the collagen from collapsing. If the collagen is over dried after phosphoric acid conditioning, it will present a barrier to the penetration of adhesive monomers. If you recall what I said about dentin bonding and bonding in general being removing mineral appetite and penetrating monomers into the holes that were made, if the collagen is dried, then underlying the dried collapsed collagen layer will be unpenetrated areas, air spaces, where the monomer has not penetrated, leaving a gap underneath the adhesive layer and ultimately underneath the restoration. Now the propensity for this to happen depends on which part of the tooth we're dealing with. Dentin, as in this slide, we know that there is a fairly good distribution of dentinal tubules which contain moisture, uh, but a fairly high level of mineral. If we go more towards the dentin enamel junction, the dentin behaves almost like enamel. But if we go into dentin that's a one to one and a half millimeters, maybe less than a millimeter from the dental pulp, we see that the surface area exposed to the adhesive or the conditioning process was represented by large volume areas of dental tubules and a relatively small amount of mineral. This is the area where collapsed collagen, if this dentin is over dried, could lead to large gaps and possible post-operative sensitivity. And then, of course, when we deal with cementum or root dentin, we're dealing with a more mineralized, more appetite-rich enamel-like structure. So is phosphoric acid conditioning the best of both worlds? Enamel, the most durable, reliable, micromechanical bond. Dentin, if we do not collapse the collagen, we interpenetrate the resin monomers, we remove the smear layer, and allow infiltration of these primers. So one of the critical parameters if we're using an etching, rinsing, dentin technique is the time. All manufacturers that recommend etching recommend etching enamel for no less than 15 seconds and dentin for no more than 15 seconds. If we etch a dentin for about 15 seconds, and we're talking now mid-coronal to deep dentin, the three to four micron uh, layer of dentin is demineralized, and in these beautiful micrographs, uh, courtesy of Marcus Vargas from the University of Iowa, we can see the collagen fibrils frozen in space that we're going to try through the moist bonding technique interpenetrate these resin monomers. If we etch longer, however, in this dentin, we etch at least double the depth. The problem, if we etch for 30 seconds, and etch and demineralize this deep, the resin monomers that we have can only penetrate to about three to five microns, leaving gaps 
underneath the resin monomers. In a vital tooth, these gaps can fill with moisture from the dentinal tubules, and moisture will inhibit the polymerization of the adhesive film and could lead to incomplete formation of the bonded interface and dentinal sensitivity, particularly as osmotic fluid pressure flows up and down the dentinal tubules. Now, one principle is that we need to understand, and this goes back to this so-called invisible interface. The steps of bonding, regardless of using a self-etching adhesive or an etching rinse adhesive, should be followed very carefully because each and every time we bond, in particular to dentin, we create a new composition of matter. At the top of this scanning micrograph, we have the adhesive resin. In the middle, or thereabouts, we see a layer called the hybrid layer. This is a mixture of collagen, some residual mineral, and resin that was interpenetrated in and around the collagen fibrils. The deep resin tags that you see can show how deep the resin monomers can penetrate into the dentinal tubules when proper moisture is retained. This hybrid layer is not created in the bottle from the manufacturer and was not created by God when he made the tooth. This is something we create each and every time we do a bonded restoration. And careful attention to the details of the manufacturer's instructions are important. Now, what causes collagen to collapse? And in this micrograph, we're not looking at the smear layer. We're looking at those collagen fibrils which have been dried and caused to collapse to create a barrier and preventing the resin monomers from penetration. So desiccating the prep and removing that surface moisture from creating the collagen to be separated and moist causes this collagen collapse. Now there's been a lot of confusion about what is moist or wet bonding. Wet or moist bonding is not saliva in the prep. It's not spit in the prep. If one could imagine, and this is after our colleague, a, a dean at the University of Washington, Dr. Joel Berg, if one walks down the beach where the ocean is coming up to the beach and going back, and as you walk with your bare feet on the surface of sand, which does not have a meniscus of water in it, but when you press down, the wet sand comes up between your toes, that's the picture in your mind of what moist dentin should look like. Now, we know that when we dry enamel vigorously, we get a frosty appearance. Well, we get the same, although not quite as defined, frosty appearance may over dry dentin. So we don't want water in the prep, but we do not want the frostiness of over dry dentin. Now, how do we achieve this? Some people say blot. Some manufacturers say lightly dry. That's really not very clinically relevant to us. So in this image, just as a very uh, easy, solid, clinical, reproducible way. The picture of moist dentin, if you could think about this, is the absence of picking up your air syringe to dry the tooth. And the way we cre can create this reproducibly is place phosphoric acid. This is a total etch technique, etch and rinse technique. And then we rinse the acid off. And when after we see the blue or whatever the, the dye of the acid is, we need to leave the water on for at least one or two more seconds to be sure that we've gotten all the residual acid and all the residual material off from the phosphoric acid gel. So we have high volume evacuation there removing the acid. Remove the air water syringe and for a count of 1001, 1002, aspirate the excess moisture off of the tooth, leaving the tooth typically visibly moist in this picture. So moist dentin is the absence of visible and forceful air directed onto the dentin to prevent this collagen collapse. And so this would represent a reasonably moist dentin absence of drying. Now, if in the corners of a prep there is some pooled saliva from curricular fluid seepage around the matrix band, simply roll up a cotton pellet and dab that excess meniscus of moisture away. Now we flood this surface, and that's the, uh, another uh, major component of success. Do not over-etch. Don't etch longer than 15 seconds. Make sure that the air syringe is not used to remove the excess moisture, and then saturate this surface.
So we want to saturate the surface and wait 15 or 20 seconds for capillary action to allow that adhesive to penetrate in and around the collagen fibrils. Now we dry. Most of these adhesive systems contain acetone or ethanol, which must be removed from the adhesive surface to allow adequate visible light polymerization and to prevent sensitivity. And then don't forget to polymerize, and we'll talk more specifically about that. And here we have nicely formed plastic dentin. Now is there evidence that we can get disasters with over drying dentin? This is a scanning micrograph of that hybrid layer using moist dentin from Dr. Pertigau at the University of Minnesota. Fully integrated, well formed, very good seal hybrid layer. This is the same adhesive after the dentin has been dried for 10 seconds, showing the collagen collapse has prevented the full penetration of these resin monomers. Now there is an etch and rinse adhesive system that seems to be very insensitive to collapsed collagen. It is called XP bond. It contains a very interesting solvent, tertiary butanol. Here we see the same micrograph, the H listing the hybrid layer, showing full and complete inner penetration of resin monomers in moist dentin and in dry dentin. But this is the only etch and rinse adhesive system available that is known to resist the collapsed collagen. And in fact, when we do static bond testing, we see that uh, XP bond is relatively insensitive to dentin in terms of its bond strengths for dentin that is over dried or over wet compared to other ethanol containing adhesive systems whose bond strengths significantly are reduced by over drying or by having too much water in the cavity preparation. So what about enamel? Does enamel have to be over dried? And the answer is if the same level of visible moisture that we see in moist dentin remains on enamel, that these uh, bonding agents, these ethanol and acetone and tertiary butanol containing bonding agents, are just as effective in binding to moist enamel. However, it's an excellent clinical tip to look at a surface like this if you're believing that you have mostly or only enamel and vigorously air drying it because once etched enamel is dried, one can easily see if there is residual protein or debris in the tooth that has present, uh, prevented full interpenetration and etching. Now let's move to the self-etching systems. These dissolve and incorporate the smear layer during the bonding process. So we have these two-step acidic primer adhesive, such as Liner Bond 2 or probably the market leader in the world, Clear Fill SE Bond. And then we have the one-step systems, which was pioneered, and this was once state-of-the-art, prompt LPOP, but it never became standard of care because this material had significant stability issues and was very ineffective at bonding to both dentin and enamel long-term. Now, the rationale for this is I went through several minutes of explaining collagen uh, exposure, residual moisture, careful conditioning, uh, multiple steps of penetration, air drying. If we remove this ambiguity of moist dentin, do we get similar results to the etch and rinse or total etch adhesive systems? And the first materials such as Prompt L Pop, the answer was a resounding no. Now what we're talking about with a system like SC Bond or Prompt L Pop or more recent systems like Xeno 4 is with an etch and rinse system we demineralize, stop, and we resin infiltrate. With the self-etching systems, these are done simultaneously, which means the collagen is never exposed, so it can never collapse. So the demineralization and penetration occur at the same time. So this smear layer, we paint on this self-etching adhesive system. The smear layer is solubilized and simultaneously fills the voids, the holes created by demineralization. We then air dry that and light cure it. Now, one of the challenges of working with these systems is we have to realize, number one, whatever is in the cavity, and if you recall I said that sometimes the bits of carbide burr remain in the cavity, becomes part of the adhesive interface. 
So the cavity preparation has to be very careful about residual debris when using a self-etching adhesive system. In addition, all of these systems contain water. And unlike acetone or ethanol or even tertiary butanol, drying water out after application is much more difficult because those other solvents are much more volatile. So in the beginning, and this was an, a, a clinical study done with Promptel Pop, 35% of the restorations fell out after one year. So the early self-etching adhesives, while state-of-the-art, never became standard of care because they never became clinically effective. Now these materials are much better so that retention rates for products like Xeno4 and Clearfill SC Bond after five years exceed, without phosphoric acid etching, exceed 90%. But another problem of all of these self-etching systems is marginal stain and marginal gap formation. While the modern self-etching adhesive systems rival the etch and rinse systems and their bond to dentin, they are totally inferior in their bonding to enamel. So in clinical situations where enamel is present, these self-etching adhesive systems lack sealing ability and have a propensity, as shown in this series of slides, for stain around the enamel margin. Now these are not simple products. The one bottle systems are very complicated mixtures of water and acidic monomer with causes of demineralization and then these acidic monomers with other resin materials to actually do the penetration and bonding. These acidic monomers not only demineralize but also are neutralized by mineral appetite coming out and covalently bond to the mineral appetite or residual calcium in the tooth. But these materials, these phosphate ester groups, with room temperature storage can break down. And it's very important for self-etching systems that the instructions for storage in your offices be followed. Warm or even room temperature storage could create a situation where over time, and we can look at a product like iBond, which in a nine-week period of time, had significantly reduced enamel and dentin bonding after room temperature storage, simply because of this hydrolysis of the active monomers in the tooth. So while these bottles look very simple, they're very complicated uh, chemical mixtures, and careful attention to the treatment and storage requirements is important. Another component of all of these adhesives, G-Bond, Geniobond, Clearfill S3 Bond, is they all work better to both enamel and dentin if they are applied with vigorous agitation. What the agitation does is it helps get fresh acidic material to the tooth structure. The agitation also is believed to help drive off some of the water with generating a little bit of heat on the tooth surface and helping volatilize that water. These materials can also phase separate as you can see here, the water material in them. So if they are called to be shaken or called to be applied immediately, they should be. Now one of the nuances about this, we're trading with self-etching adhesives less complexity about understanding moist dentin because we don't have to worry about dentin moisture for these systems. But the drying step must be handled carefully. Because there are acetone or alcohol solvents with water and high molecular weight monomers, the initial drying step for these materials should be gentle so that we do not literally blow the adhesive off of the tooth and onto the tissue. That initial blowing gets off the volatile solvent and then creates the water and acidic monomer mixture in which we can blow a little bit more vigorously to remove that uh, excess water. So with a product like Prem and Bond Elect uh, or materials that have uh, ethanol in them, the acetone or alcohol evaporates pretty quickly. The water will then deposit and if that water isn't removed it will start a phase separation that we remove by more strongly air drying. So one of the technique tips that we would suggest is that an air water syringe should be very carefully used because there's always 
water coming out of these syringes, these sometimes the valves don't work quite as well. And having just an air syringe tear site, if you do a lot of adhesive bonding for removal of solvents, will generate a better result because you're not contaminating that surface, uh, the adhesive surface with potentially with water uh, coming out of that uh, multiple flex syringe. So again, we want to gently air dry these self etching materials from a distance, a half an inch or so, for three to five seconds, and that depends on your bonding agent. If it's an acetone containing bonding agent, that could be one to three seconds. If it's an ethanol containing self etching system, probably three to five seconds is more important because ethanol is a little less volatile. Then get closer to the adhesive film for an additional two to five seconds to more vigorously remove the water. If you just vigorously blow for one to two seconds immediately, you will displace and literally blow off the margins of your preparation, the adhesive that you're hoping to bond the composite to those same interfaces. Now, because of the deficit of enamel bonding, there are some clinical situations where etching really is indicated. But there are some situations where self-etching systems may be preferred. When mostly dentin is present, or when the uh, isolation of a tooth is shown in this particular slide on the left, where we're looking at an onlay preparation, we're having a little bit of trouble controlling curvicular uh, fluid and blood on the mesial part of this restoration, placing phosphoric acid in this situation would just promote a difficult clinical environment because it would promote bleeding. In these situations where there's mostly dentin, a self-etching adhesive system probably would be preferred. In a situation, for example, on the left here, an upper second molar, where it would be very difficult to get rubber dam isolation, and we're putting phosphoric acid back there and controlling the field might be difficult, using a self-etching system may actually be preferred to using an etch and rinse system. Now, the self-etching systems have been promoted to reportedly generate fewer post-op sensitivity situations with patients. But if a total etch or etch and rinse system is used properly with moist dentin, with adequate uh, saturation of the dentin, with adequate drying of the solvents and light curing, the clinical evidence shows that across a variety of self-etch and etch and rinse or total etch systems that the post-operative sensitivity between these two categories of materials is the same. So there is a bit of a myth that self-etching systems of and to themselves create a situation where there's post-op sensitivity because we're etching the dentin. Used properly, used with the right technique, the sensitivity, post-op sensitivity for both of these classes of adhesives is the same. Now, can you etch enamel with self-etching systems? And this is the selective etching system. Well, the answer is it will most definitely improve enamel bond strengths. However, products like Clearfill SE Bond, Clearfill S3 Bond, G Bond have not been validated to have phosphoric acid leak onto the dentin. And in fact, SE Bond's dentin bond, which is excellent as a self-etching system, is reduced in half if it's applied to etched dentin. So selective etching or use of phosphoric acid with self-etching adhesives is in general contraindicated. And this has led to the creation of now the new state-of-the-art, the, the so-called universal adhesives, or as I like to say, it's the Burger King method. You can have it your way, doctor, based on your clinical situation. You can use the systems as a self-etching adhesive. The bond strength to dentin is excellent. The bond strength to enamel is the same as other self-etching adhesives, but not equal to what is able to be generated with phosphoric acid. These systems can be used with etch and rinse, or total etch, where enamel and dentin is etched, and the dentin bond strength does not drop as a result of the dentin being etched with what can be successful in a self-etching technique. And what is now really the, the, the true uh, developing standard of care is the so-called selective etch. Because these materials bond well to etched enamel, 
and bond well to unetched dentin, products like Scotch Bond Universal and Prime and Bond Elect are promoting, and with good reason, the best of both worlds. Selectively etching enamel when there's a volume or an area of enamel that makes it worthwhile, and intentionally attempting not to etch dentin when possible. So if we look at a clinical situation like this where there's a lot of dentin, we could apply our adhesive just in a self-etching mode. We could apply our adhesive with an etch and rinse mode, but in that deep dentin, managing the collagen, the moisture, may be problematic. Or we can just attempt to selectively etch those areas where there's a significant portion of enamel. Now, obviously, when we rinse this off, some of that phosphoric acid will somewhat demineralize the dentin, but we're not intentionally removing the smear layer and demineralizing the dentin. And these new universal adhesives have a window of forgiveness, which gives us this technique as a really good option, particularly when we're dealing with, with deep dentin. So when we look at this decision tree, if we have mostly enamel and only a small areas of exposed dentin, then our, our concern about etching creating voids and leaving dentin moist is much less, and we can totally etch, etch and rinse both enamel and dentin. If we have mostly dentin, these materials work very well with dentin bonding, um, and that would be the, lo the, the, the bottom uh, box, which would be the so-called self-etching. If we have dentin with some enamel, as we would, for example, in doing an indirect ceramic onlay, or a posterior composite where the occlusal surface has a significant amount of enamel, but we may be below the DEJ uh, in the interproximal area. Then selectively etching the enamel with only incidental dentin contact would be the decision tree. So once again, if we go back to our areas of dentin, when we're in mid-coronal dentin, etching this dentin probably won't generate a problem, but we might want to avoid it and selectively etch if there's enough enamel. If we're looking at dentin near the DEJ, where there's mostly enamel and a little bit of this kind of dentin, etching this will not be a problem because this material behaves more like enamel. In deep dentin, I think we would want to employ the self-etching method or if there's some enamel, selectively etching this area. And on sclerotic areas like this, a selectively etching enamel uh, would also be indicated. So if we look at the Prem and Bond Elect, this is an acetone-containing a universal adhesive system, we would want to focus on a couple of, of areas. Number one, if we etch, we only want to etch 15 seconds on dentin, no more, but no less than 15 seconds on enamel. Now I want to highlight the bottom left box where we apply generous amounts of this material, this is an acetone containing material, and thoroughly wet and agitate for 20 seconds to allow full penetration, and this would be whether the dentin is etched or whether we're using a self-etching technique. And then the drying step to remove these solvents. So a gentle dry followed by maybe a little more vigorous drying step. The acetone in this material comes off very quickly to thoroughly dry. And then something that's often overlooked is light curing. Sometimes 10 seconds of light curing in a deep cavity or a complicated cavity where there are parallel walls to the light will not be adequate. Sometimes 20 seconds of light curing for the adhesive might be indicated from two different directions to fully polymerize, visible light polymerize an adhesive in a complicated cavity prep. Now with Prime and Bond Elect when using it for indirect restorations, we need to apply as seen in step three in the bottom left, a self-cure activator to have this acidic adhesive compatible with dual cure cements. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. So this would be Prime and Bond Elect. And as, as I just mentioned, it does, uh, it can be used for indirect restorations. It has an extremely low film thickness. So Prime and Bond Elect is ideal for indirect uh, crowns, inlays, and onlays because its film thickness is very low and will not inhibit seeding. But when using a dual cure resin cement, the self-care activator must be mixed with that resin cement. Now, Prum and Bond contains a phosphate acid monomer, 
uh, this monomer is, is, is called penta, and there's a complicated chemical monomer on this. This acidic material does demineralize, but also bonds via a complex formation, a covalent bond with remaining calcium mineral appetite in the tooth. And this does add some stability and some sealing ability to the bond and the bonded interface using this acidic monomer. Now, the universal adhesives have a variety of film thicknesses, and low film thicknesses are advantageous to us clinically, number one, because high film thickness radiographs can fool us, or high film thickness adhesives can fool us in post-operative radiographs that look like voids or look like recurrent caries, but often are pooled adhesive, particularly in the corners of sharp cavity preparations. And so we can see uh, in these photomicrographs that other universal adhesives such as Clearfill, uh, Optibon XTR, Scotchbond Universal have significantly higher film thickness uh, than the primary bond elect, which is a very thin acetone containing material. So selectively etching does not increase the propensity for post-op sensitivity because we're dealing primarily with not opening up those dentinal tubules. And so again, how easy is it to selectively etch? Well, it, in small cavity preparations, it can be a challenge, but again, there's a window of forgiveness with these universal adhesives. So just to conclude some thoughts, if you're bonding to both enamel and dentin, clinical judgment should be used that selectively etching or totally etching and rinsing uh, techniques approach uh, the, the highest level of bonding that was achieved uh, with other more traditional adhesive agents. If you're bonding to just dentin, a crown preparation for example, use the self-etching component of it. These universal adhesives bond very well to dentin. Uh, however, if there's not enough enamel, why worry about opening up tubules that you will have to fill? If you're using a dual cure material, however, you definitely must use uh, some kind of uh, agent that is compatible and consistent with uh, those other materials that have dual cure nature. Now, just a brief word about polymerization. We've all been told and taught that the most vulnerable part of a class two is that gingival interface. And so applying the, the adhesive agent in, the, in that area well and also Photopolymerizing that well is very important. Now we know that when we put the light on top of the tooth, we're assuming that light is getting to all of that adhesive because if the tooth glows blue, we think, we think that every part of that tooth is getting equal energy. But if we slightly adjust our light, we can get areas of the adhesive that are under or unpolymerized. Unpolymerized adhesives on a tooth are soluble even if you copolymerize composite resin on top of it. Thus, our recommendation is that in a cavity preparation like this, you cure for 10 seconds from at least two angles when you have a significant number of vertical cavity walls to be sure that the photo, uh, photopolymerization energy is as much perpendicular to all the surfaces as possible. Also, the dual cure activator that's used in this particular example with Xeno4 and is also used with Prem and Bond Elect. If we have a self or an acidic adhesive on the tooth, that acidic adhesive produces an oxygen inhibited layer that is acidic. And when we place on top of that a dual cure looting composite that is typically cured with benzoyl peroxide and a tertiary amine to promote free radical polymerization. Well, the tertiary amine is a base, and the acidic interface then becomes under-polymerized because it inhibits the total polymerization that's driven by this chemistry system, which means careful attention to matching your resin cement and the adhesive system and following directions of the adhesive system when using an indirect technique is critical for maximum success. So as we conclude, I hope you take the conclusion that with adhesives, they seem simple, but they're not simpler. We must follow very carefully attention to detail. Don't over-etch. Fully 
leave moisture in the dentin with an etch and rinse adhesive technique to provide penetration of resin monomers into the tooth. Air dry that solvent and light cure. In a self-etching adhesive, apply with agitation. Dry longer and with less vigorous force to make sure that solvent and water are removed and again, recognize that these systems, self-etching systems alone, do not provide the kind of enamel adhesion that a phosphoric acid conditioning system does provide. So with that, I would like to conclude my formal remarks and respond to questions that come from the audience. There we are. Okay, the question is, we replace a lot of amalgams with composite. How does the absorption of corrosion byproducts in the dentin affect the efficacy of the bond and longevity. There is very little, there is very, well, uh, Dr. Boxman, thank, thank you very much for, um, uh, for the question. You're right, there is very little uh, in the literature about that. What we do know is that even though there are corrosion products and there's typically they're absorbed into the dentinal tubules, there is significant mineral appetite in the dentin. And so the use of an adhesive system that demineralizes and interpenetrates around uh, the, the collagen fibrils, uh, or if it's a, a situation where you're using a self-etching adhesive, that there is still a hybrid layer that is formed. The mineral, uh, or I'm sorry, the corrosion byproducts do not seem to inhibit uh, the polymerization of the adhesive films themselves. Um, the second question is, the smear layer is garbage. Well, it's debris, yeah, we do have garbage in it. Uh, the concept of using the smear layer, well, the concept of leaving the smear layer in a self-etching technique is really, uh, uh, it, it has been successful. There have been a lot of clinical studies that have shown that it doesn't, doesn't seem to be a huge problem. Um, but it is true that using phosphoric acid conditioning does cleanse the cavity and removes not just debris and bacteria, uh, but also, as I said, any debris as a result of the instrumentation of the tooth. If the self-etching adhesive that incorporates and dissolves the smear layer is adequately dried so that the water is out and then adequately polymerized, there doesn't seem to be huge issues um, uh, unless there's huge contamination in the cavity prep. Next question is, do I line a box in a class two with a flow before placing a bulk composite? And do I recommend a desensitizer such as shield force? Um, the answer to the first question is yes. I think using a flowable liner, uh, particularly a, a bulk fill liner in the box, is a very convenient way of assuring full adaptation after the adhesive is placed. Do I recommend a desensitizer? No, I think a desensitizer is unnecessary in most clinical situations, uh, if the tooth is adequately diagnosed and if the adhe whatever adhesive system that is being employed is employed properly. Uh, have I studied heart tissue? Let me, I'm going down here, i make sure. Have I studied uh, hard tissue lasers and do I have suggestions for a bonding technique or products that work better with laser preps? Yes, we have studied hard tissue lasers and there was a very misleading uh, Journal of Dental Research article that suggested that using an etch and rinse adhesive system, that by using a hard tissue laser, that you did not need to use phosphoric acid conditioning and the answer is absolutely false, you do. Uh, laser treated dentin because of the technique and sometimes because of the heat buildup, if it's not deep dentin, is, most very li is, is likely most going to be effective with an etch and rinse uh, adhesive system. Uh, but following all the same principles about leaving the dentin visibly moist. Uh, so that would be my suggestion of uh, the evidence is that etch and rinse adhesive systems work well. That doesn't mean self-etching adhesive systems don't, but given the change in dentin structure, etch and rinse adhesive systems is probably a better bet. What about using soap and water to remove the smear layer instead of using phosphoric acid? Well, the problem with soap and water is uh, Soap has chelating agents which could potentially demineralize the tooth, but then you have other things in soap that are going to be residual and soap can act like a lubricant uh, or, or have oils in them that will leave residual materials and that will interfere with the subsequent application uh, of the, uh, 
the, the material. Again, using phosphoric acid with an etanol adhesive system or with a universal adhesive system is indicated. Uh, the only other material I would ever use to demineralize dentin might be polyacrylic acid, and I would only use that to get a glass ionomer material to bond a little bit better to tooth structure uh, by removing a little bit of the smear layer with the polyacrylic acid. Um, I would not use soap in a cavity preparation because of what might be left and interfere with bonding. Does the thickness of the smear layer or its consistency affect the neutralization of the self-edge? Yes, there is some evidence that that is true, that rougher surfaces produce a thicker smear layer uh, and generate more mineral for neutralization of the self-etching system, where a very smooth surface, a very highly polished surface, has less of that smear layer, uh, less, less smear layer to penetrate. Now, too thick of a smear layer and the self-etching material doesn't penetrate all the way to the underlying dentin. Um, with the kinds of surfaces left with carbides and diamonds uh, within the range of, of certain surface finishes, it doesn't seem to be a major issue. Um, but in extreme cases, yeah, it could be. Um, do I recommend using dual care activator every time that Xeno-4 is used? No. The activator is really intended to make Xeno-4 compatible with uh, a core material or a dual care resin cement over top. Xeno-4 works just fine to dentin uh, and polymerizes uh, well uh, without the self-care activator when a totally visible light cured composite is applied on top of it. So I use Luma or 2% chlorhexine after etching to re-wet the dentin and to inhibit dentin proteins. Um, I do not use Gluma. We do teach in our school, and I do use in deep dentin 2% chlorhexidine, uh, and leave that at do not. I do not rinse that material. I leave that as the wetting agent. The caution here is that a product like Concepsis, which contains no other oils, just this chlorhexidine should be used. A mouth rinse, which has a lot of other uh, flavoring agent and oils in it, should not be used. Uh, for this technique for inhibiting the metalloproteinases in dentin. Do I ever use a liner such as UltraBlend and Theracal, and do I replace it before selective etch? And the answer is, uh, we, w when we're using, a, when we're in a situation, uh, this is what we teach our students because we're still inexpensive here, we, would, we could use UltraBlend or Theracal but not remove it and replace it in a selective etch technique. More likely, uh, in a situation where we're concerned about pulpal protection, uh, is we use a glass ionomer uh, and use that as a base. And there are a lot of advantages to using glass ionomers uh, in terms of managing uh, uh, situations where um, we're in deep dentin or where we may be below the deep dentin enamel junction and are concerned about micro leakage. Uh, Dr. Graber, review the dual cure cement over an adhesive. When, when we're applying a dual cure cement that has a benzoyl peroxide and amine a, a chemical system, and these are cements you can light cure and then mix two components together and will cure on their own. One has to be careful of using an adhesive that is either not acidic or is mixed with some kind of activator that makes it compatible with the cement. And frankly, this is the one area where you can use almost any composite over any adhesive system, like your composite. But this is one area where I would strongly recommend that if, you're, uh, if you like a resin-based cement, that you stay with that manufacturer's adhesive system because those chemistries are compatible. Uh, but there are known incompatibilities because of this, uh, these chemistries that are complicated and because of the inhibition of the acidity of the adhesive. Even once it's cured, that so top layer can be acidic enough to inhibit the amine and under-polymerize or not polymerize at all the dual cure part of the resin cement. I hope that answered your question, Dr. Graber. Can Fuji 9 be placed close to pulp or need pulp protection? This is a terrific question. Um, the difficulty we have clinically is we don't know what the residual dentin thickness is. Um, the studies seem to show that a residual dentin thickness, that it's a thickness of dentin over the pulp of a half millimeter or greater, and something like Fuji 9, which is a little bit acidic, can be placed as a base. Uh, but when in doubt, pulp protection is never a bad idea. 
Uh, what are my thoughts on repairing versus replacing composite that Dr. Ward? Um, I think refurbishing composite is a very uh, good and conservative way because every time um, we remove the full extent of a composite restoration, we take away more tooth structure and sometimes that tooth structure was well bonded and didn't need to be replaced. Now the idea about repairing a composite if there's a defective margin or uh, a, a chip requires that the that old composite have the new adhesive agent be bonded to. And so that technique must be done with more than just acid conditioning. Uh, air abrasion, particularly with a product called CoJet, which uh, embeds into the old composite, a silenizable particle is the best way to repair a composite. So I like that, but it is a comp somewhat complicated technique to do it really well. Um, would I be able to explore a little bit about carboxylic acid being an MMP inhibitor? Well, carboxylic acid is technically not an MMP inhibitor. Um, there are phosphoric acid from, uh, preparations that contain uh, 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 some compounds in them that will inhibit MMPs, and chlorhexidine is, is, is one of those. Uh, there's a phosphoric acid uh, preparation from, from Bisco uh, that contains an antibiotic agent, an agent that inhibits MMPs simultaneously with the acid, but I'm personally not familiar with carboxylic acid itself inhibiting MMPs. What do I use for pulp protection? Uh, personally, when I'm that close to the pulp, uh, I, we, we would use something like life or, or, uh, or uh, calcium hydroxide uh, if we're concerned about microexposures. Um, MTA for pulp protection is a very complicated procedure if, if there are pulp exposures. But if we're talking about pulp protection where there's no evidence of pulp exposure, uh, I, I use a glass ionomer and I like traditional glass ionomers, uh, not resin modified glass ionomers. Question, after the adhesive has been polymerized and accidentally contaminated by saliva, what would you do? Tough call. Uh, I would take a low speed and a round burr and very, very gently regrind the dentin to remove all contamination and rebond. Because you don't know, uh, there's, there's proteinaceous matter in saliva that could bond to the adhesive that could create an interface that would create micro leakage. Um, can I talk about adhering dual cure cements to zirconia, uh, Dr. Berg? I can talk briefly about it. Um, I, I think that's a, probably a whole hour uh, to talk about bonding uh, to ceramics in general. A um, couple of real important technique tips of bonding cements to zirconia. Number one is how the zirconia should be treated. Zirconia should be air braided. Um, if the dual cure cement contains something like Penta or MDP, acidic primers, that will bond well to the zirconia as, as well as pretty much as anything you could get to bond to zirconia. If it doesn't, a preparation like ZR prep or uh, some other zirconia bonding prep should be used prior to that. But the most important thing is if you're trying in a zirconia restoration, that the zirconia should be cleaned with a product called IvoClean to remove the saliva because the saliva, the pellicle saliva, or, or the proteins in saliva, the I'm sorry, the phosphates in saliva actually bond to zirconia and prevent the adhesive part of cements from bonding to the zirconia. So the, the, the most important part about the dual cure cement zirconia is how you treat the zirconia. It should be air braided. If it's tried in, it should be cleaned with IvoClean. And then an MDP or Penta containing cement should be used or a, a liquid uh, primer agent should be painted on the zirconia for the dual cure cement. Uh, uh, Theracal is fine for direct and indirect pulp caps, Dr. Ward. Uh, I have no bias against, against Theracal. Um, it's a little more expensive, and working, to be honest with you, working in a dental school as I do, we, we tend to be more traditional. But Theracal would be a fine product for, for direct pulp caps. Uh, there is some pretty good evidence that it's effective. Yeah, Ceramir or Zirconia. A Ceramir is a, a, a great cement. Um, I, I think there's some evidence that it does, it does form that mineral appetite component. It has some... Uh, you know, in some growth studies that uh, Cornelius Pommier has done that shows some good retention, 
with that. But and go back to the going back to the question about adhering dual cure cement zirconia. In any indirect situation, and particularly a posterior situation where isolation is difficult, don't use more cement that's needed. And what I mean by that is, if the crown has good retention and resistance form, then using a conventional cement, regardless of how well it bonds to tooth structure or the ceramic, is probably indicated. And using a material in a posterior situation where isolation is difficult that's moisture sensitive and no dual cured resin cement has much moisture forgiveness, in my opinion, would be indicated. So Ceramere, which is fairly moisture sensitive in a posterior situation in a tooth that has reasonable retention resistance form should work extremely well with zirconia based restorations. In that situation, I would use a cement that's easier to clean up too. Oh, oh, okay. So Dr. Ward's asking, do I cure buccal lingually uh, after the removal of a Toffelmeyer matrix or matrix removal? Yeah, I, I, Dr. Ward, I think that, 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 that from a philosophical perspective, because I've done a lot, of, a fair amount of work both clinically and in the laboratory with light here and polymerization, you can't over polymerize these things. And if if you use particularly a high powered light where you're thinking that a five second cure, and you ever watch your assistant, as we watch dental students. We recommend a, a two-handed light curing technique where the, uh, the dominant hand is holding the, 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 the light and the non-dominant hand is actually holding the end of the probe or the head of the LED chassis on the tooth because very slight movements of the hand will, in a short light cure, significantly degrade the energy going to the tooth. And there's so many angles uh, and so many variables about depth of cure, it's, it's, it's influenced by the shade of composite, influenced by the thickness of tooth. Yes, I would do multiple cures, buccal, lingual, occlusal, um, after removal of the matrix um, on, on any class two or any posterior restor restoration. And I do multiple angles even after I apply the adhesive, depending upon the size of the cavity and the, and the location and the arch and the, and the configuration of the cavity preparation. Uh, people think that because the tooth glows blue that everything is getting cured, but the walls that are parallel to the light are not receiving as much uh, much light energy as one might think. Uh, 